Welcome everyone to Writers Speak, dedicated to the written word and those who produce it. I'm Jeannie Sloan, your host, and I am the author of three historical novels about women during World War II. Today in our studio, I am very happy to be talking to Charles Prickett, the author of Remembering Mississippi, Freedom Summer. Thank you, Jeannie. I appreciate being here. Thanks for asking me. And thank you for being able to share with us your wonderful book and um, the historical memoir that I really appreciate you writing so that we will not forget what happened. It's definitely something we should not forget. And it, as you say, it's a, such a strong part of our American history. And I, this, just this past week, I've given eight lectures in high schools, uh, Santa Rosa Junior College, and for independent groups. And uh, I show this movie, A Regular Bouquet, which I helped make in 1964, along with Richard Beamer, and uh, tell about the March on Washington, the Mississippi Freedom Summer, and the Selma Montgomery March all three of which I participated in or was a staff member. And I was paid, uh, I tell people, I was paid $14 a week to get shot at and firebombed. <laughs> so that was, that was a, I guess, a, a bargain at that, uh, at that price. Well, you and I both know it's so important that we do not forget the horrific parts of history so they're not repeated. And it, it was a horrific part, and if I may, I'd just like to read you uh, my brief account on the back of my book, which is available on Amazon, Remembering Mississippi Freedom Summer. And I began, the year is 1964. Imagine a country where you are a slave. You have no rights. You cannot attend public schools, the public library, restaurants, parks, churches, or movie theaters. You cannot vote or meet and organize with others like yourself who are denied these rights. That country is the United States of America and the state of Mississippi. You are black. Remembering Mississippi Freedom Summer, which is this book, is my account as a college student and civil rights activist working in the Mississippi Freedom Summer of 1964. This account explores the rural Mississippi and the black community's effort, efforts to change the stifling and brutal system of racism that touched every life. The Mississippi Freedom Summer focused on four goals. First, freedom schools, which tried to fill the gaps left by a segregated educational system that denied black citizens a quality education. And I want to point out this is 10 years after a unanimous Supreme Court decided in Brown versus Board of Education that segregated education is inherently unequal in violation of the 14th Amendment to our Constitution. The second is the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, which we organized that summer, and we tried to give a political voice to the disenfranchised black citizens. The third is black farmers were organized so they could share in federal programs that support agriculture. And finally, we had voter registration drives to try to register black citizens to vote, although this was before the Voting Rights Act of 1965, a year later, and so our results were futile. But it was a badge of honor to keep trying. And I, the people in the black community that I be, became a part of were not to be denied. And they would say, I've been denied 15 times, and by golly, next week, they'll register me to vote, and I'll be able to vote. So it was quite a, an eye-opening experience as a young college student. I was 19 and turned 20 that summer. And uh, so this is my first person account of that experience. I did want to be able to tell our audience a little about your background before we get into the details. That um, I believe you obtained the skills of being a mechanic, a plumber, a carpenter, and a teacher during that summer. Is that correct? Well, I, I certainly uh, 
exhibited those skills that summer, that's for sure. That was yeah. my first, first job teaching. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually, I, I eventually earned a, a doctorate in education. So that was something that uh, really helped identify and uh, the rest of my life and what I did as for a profession. Yeah. And uh, presently, you are an attorney and a judge right here in Santa Rosa. Well, I've been a pro tem judge for about 30 years. And, mm -hmm. and actually, right now, I, I took a hiatus from being a pro tem judge, but I'm still an attorney. Mm -hmm. I really would like to know what your parents said when you said you were going off to Mississippi from a white community in Southern Illinois to become a civil right, rights activist. Well, my parents were totally freaked out. And not only for me, but for my sister Kay, because we both went to Mississippi that summer. My sister was the treasurer of the local SNCC, SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. There was a chapter on almost every college campus, and she was at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, Illinois, my, my hometown. Kay, my sister Kay was the treasurer. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, she went, and I went, and my parents were so afraid that they would never see us again. They took out life insurance policies on both of us so they could bury us because oh. they thought that we would never come home again except in a pine box. Oh my. But they were supportive. My father was, I think, largely responsible for Kay and I's attitudes about civil rights and mm -hmm. equality and racism. Yeah. And um, they came down to visit us, both, oh. both my mom and dad. Oh. And they were, they were the only parents that I saw all summer come to a, a project in Mississippi to visit their, their children. No one Which else. was even risky for them to do, I imagine. It was. They had Illinois license plates, and when someone came south, they were all, almost always followed if they had out-of-state plates. And mm -hmm. I, the same was true for my parents. They were followed. But they, nothing happened to them, but uh, they certainly were brave and came to see Kay and I, thinking that maybe that's the last time they would see us. Oh, that's really, I can just imagine as a parent. I know that I in involved myself a little bit. I went, um, I was in the March on Washington in 1970. There were, I guess there were a few marches. There, there have been, although. This the was against the Vietnam War. And I didn't tell my parents. <laughs> <laughs> Well, as a result, I guess you had to. <laughs> well, I I did. I told them I I didn't ask their permission. I just w did things. You know, I think that's what a lot of young people do. And yeah. my sister and I did too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, getting back to the civil rights um, movement, I know that uh, you were trained in um, non uh, how to. Um, become nonviolent, and they called it nonviolent training. That's, that's correct. Yeah, we were, uh, the philosophy of the movement, of the civil rights movement, was really to emulate Gandhi and his philosophies and his, his idea of civil disobedience. If, if a law or a directive is, uh, is immoral, you have the duty to oppose it and oppose it nonviolently. And, and that's what we tried to do. We had workshops on nonviolent uh, ways of protecting yourself. You roll up and, into a ball and protect your midsection and put your hands over your head to protect you know, your, your face and the back of your head and so on. And, and people could wail on you and beat on you and kick you and hopefully you could absorb those blows without yeah. serious injury. And we, we did the training, but uh, it was different in, in practice. I mean, I, I was struck and I uh, wasn't seriously beaten. I still have all my teeth and I got no broken bones, but I did get uh, did hit several times. But it's, it's, uh, it wasn't bad and it seems like you know, everyone should try to avoid that, but when you're in that situation, there's not much you can do and um, we just tried to protect ourselves from, from serious injury and not strike out, not strike back. And uh, I tr did my best to emulate that. Although I, I wasn't always successful, but I, I certainly was angry, but I tried not to show it. 
I was going to ask you if you actually had to use it, and I guess you did. I, I did, although a few times I, uh, I, back, I was backsliding. I, I, was, I remember one, one sheriff uh, tried to go in the back door of our house, and it was like the fourth time they, had, they would show up at the, at the Freedom House, which we, every house that civil rights work, workers lived in was called a Freedom House. And uh, they would show up and run into the front of the house with their cars, a little six, seven hundred square foot house that would shake. It was just on piers. And then three or four cars of deputies would be following the sheriff and they would surround the house and come inside and shove us around or punch us a few times. And after the third or fourth time, I, I just lost my temper. And this one sheriff ran, out, ran to the back door and I jumped up on the little stairs and shoved him down the three rickety stairs and told him to, if he wanted to visit me, he should go to the front door and knock. And he actually went around to the front and he could have shot me right then. And that's the one time that I can remember that I really lost it and I was just incensed at my civil rights being violated, just like everyone else was. And, mm -hmm. and I wasn't the only person that ever did that, but that was uh, one instance where I, where I lost it. So tell us, why was voting so difficult for a black in, in Mississippi? Well, there were a lot of barriers for anyone black who wanted to register to vote. And you had to go to the county courthouse and make, fill out an application before the registrar of voters. And then if you were black, you had to pass a literacy test. And the literacy tests were extremely difficult, if not impossible, to pass. And I'd like to mention that that literacy test is in the back of the book. Yeah, I actually I've got three as appendices in this book. I've got one from Mississippi, Louisiana, and Alabama. And they are amazing to read. And I, I used to, when I was lecturing in front of the history classes at the junior college, I would the instructor would tell the students, if you can pass this test, you get an A in the, in the course. But we changed it down, if, down to where if you can get one question right, you can get an A. You can't even get one question right. These, these tests are just a subterfuge for preventing people to vote. And then after one of the questions, I recall Fannie Lou Hamer told me about this. She said that uh, one of the questions says, by whom you're employed. And when you put down your employer, you're fired by the time you get back home. And I actually saw that in our, in our community in uh, Madison County, Mississippi. The people would try to register, and they would lose their job because the registrar would call their employer and say, you know, your so-and-so was down here, your sharecropper trying to register and you better do something about it. And they did, they fired him. So it was a very dangerous act back then for yeah. black to even try to vote. Yeah, and people kept trying, and they were, my, my just, I, I couldn't believe their, how brave they were and, and determined. And I remember trying, we would go around and try to get people to try to register, and I went, I spoke with this one farmer, he was very successful, he had three tractors and farmed about 600 acres. He was, and in, where, I, where I was living there, Black farmers own 60% of the, of the farmland. So he, he said, well, I, I can't, I don't have the time right now, but I've gone before. But he asked me to wait a second. He wanted to show me something. And he went to his house, came back with a cigar box. I remember it was a Roy Tan cigar box. And he opens it up, it's full of little slips of paper. And it said, poll tax, $2 and a date on the reverse side. He said, you know, Charles, if I'm ever able to register to vote, I'll be able to vote because I've paid my poll tax over 20 years and he had every receipt <laughs> in, that, in that box. And he was determined to have his voice heard as part of our democratic system of government. And it is your voice, your vote is your voice. And that's what we tried to do to register people to vote and to give them a voice through the Democratic Free, Freedom Democratic Party. And, uh, it was finally successful after Congress passed the Voting Rights Act of 1965. The appendix I found as fascinating as the book. So in the appendix you have the um, 
the three uh, sample uh, voting literacy tests. And also, I really got so much out of reading Dr. Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. And that, that was an amazing speech. And the reason that I put it in here is, well, I have two reasons. The first is that I was there in 1963 in August on that hot day in, in Washington, D.C., and I heard him give the speech. And the, the whole day, everyone, half a million, three quarters of a million people were all talking, relating one-on-one, -on -one, not really paying attention. But King was the last speaker. When Dr. King got up to speak, it just stopped everyone in their tracks and phrases like, I have a dream, I have a dream was on everyone's mind at the end of the speech, but phrases like, I have a dream, one day my children will be judged by the content of their character, not by the color of their skin, and those phrases resonate today. But I, I also believe that that speech set the tone for the civil rights movement mm -hmm. for the next decade. Unfortunately, King didn't make it through the next decade, but his yeah. speech is alive and well today. Yeah, I, I had heard it before, but absorbing it in the written, seeing it written, was still as powerful. It's a very powerful speech. It is. It yeah. really is. And then in the appendix, you have something also very frightening, was the declaration of a witness who participated in the murders of three civil rights workers. Yes, this is a declaration of Horace Barnett uh, <sighs> given to the FBI in November of that year, and uh, of, of 64. And he talks about the, the murders of Schwerner, Goodman, and Cheney, and how they were pulled out of their car, taken to a rural area, and shot. He describes it in such detail, and their reactions, and, and uh, it's, it's gruesome. And it, it's interesting because this, it's my understanding that he testified at, a, at the trial in Neshoba County where the three civil, record, or civil rights workers were found and uh, the, some of the defendants included the sheriff and deputy sheriff of Neshoba County. And the jury rejected it and said, oh, there's not enough evidence. They didn't, didn't uh, find murder charges against these, against the defendants at that time. There were about six that were charged. Um, they were later convicted in federal court for interfering with the civil rights of these three young men, and they spent, uh, the longest session that they spent was six years in jail. But uh, in 2004, Richard Beamer and I went to Mississippi and showed the, his movie, the, the one that we made in 64, A Regular Bouquet, Mm -hmm. And um, when we were there, another defendant was tried and convicted of those murders, Reverend Killen, and he is presently serving a life sentence in Mississippi right now. Could you tell us um, more about that movie? Well, this, uh, Richard Beamer, as, as uh, most people don't recognize his name, but he was opposite Natalie Wood in the classic West Side Story. Oh. And it was Tony, you know, and so uh -huh. my, my wife... Uh, I'm kinda, very familiar with the movie, but oh. I didn't recognize his name. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's who he is. And, uh, he, he was on my project. I was, I, be, I became, I was a project director um, in the rural county of, of Mississippi, where I was, Madison County. The county seat is Canton, which is about 50 miles directly north of Jackson, which is right in the center of Mississippi. But Richard was was uh, was on our committee, was on our on our staff there. He was a volunteer. He drove his his car out from California. He retained his California license plates. It was a uh, uh, Austin Healey 3000, which I loved driving, and he he seemed fine with me driving it all over the place. So I did. <laughs> but at any rate, that's that's an aside. But uh, Richard wanted to film what we were doing, and today. A regular bouquet on the outtakes is really the only film record of the Freedom Summer, of uh, Freedom Schools, voter registration drives, mass meetings, all of those things. And this film is available on YouTube. If you just put in Google uh, Mississippi Freedom Summer mm -hmm. uh, or 
that, that, that will bring you up to my, uh, probably my website, but if you put a regular bouquet Freedom Summer, something like that, you'll see it, and click on it, it's on YouTube, and it's also in the archives of Washington University Film Archives, Washington University in, in St. Louis, Missouri. But uh, it'll pop up and you can watch the whole thing and, and it's 28 minutes long and uh, I urge everyone to watch this movie. It, it's a, a depiction of what actually happened and, and you probably will recognize some of the scenes because it's been used on the PBS documentaries such as Eyes on the Prize and several others that have been produced. I can think of five or six that uh, have used uh, Richard's film because it's the only film available. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for telling our audience about uh, being able to view this film. That will um, be a good educational experience for everyone. And I urge teachers to show it in their classrooms too. Have um, a lot of the schools used your book as curriculum? Um, I, they have referred to it, and every time I present at a high school, I donate books to the library and to the class. I've, most recently, I was at Montgomery High, mm -hmm. and uh, I've been at Casa Grande and, and Petaluma and, and other places. Uh, actually, one, one particular incident, though, uh, stands out in my mind. I was at a fifth grade class over in Sebastopol, and the whole class stood up and recited King's I Have a Dream speech. Oh. I couldn't, so I asked people, are you smarter than a fifth grader? None of them are. <laughs> they must have had a good teacher. They did. They yeah. did. <laughs> had, that must have been really thrilling for you to um, see. Yeah, I, 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 I can't recite that speech, <sighs> but these kids could, boy, and they were, they were, uh, I, I feel like the future is in good hands with these kids. And, you know, they'll remember that the rest of their lives. That's what's interesting when you are asked to memorize something when you're young. It, you can retain it for so long. Do you feel that your experience during Freedom Summer uh, helped shape your life and that's why you became an attorney? It, that certainly had a lot to do with it. It, uh, it certainly made me focus on education. And when I was completing uh, doctoral work at Syracuse University, um, I decided to go to law school because at that time the Equal Rights Amendment for women was going from, I, I thought it would certainly pass, it was going from state legislature to state legislature. Finally it didn't pass, I was shocked, but I decided to focus on children's rights. And uh, so when I came to California in 79, I was an instructor at Sonoma State. And then Prop 13 really destroyed the funding for public education. And since I had a law degree, and since I got laid off from Sonoma State, I took the bar exam and passed it, and I've been a lawyer ever since. Otherwise, I would probably still be a professor of education at Sonoma State. But uh, it, it made me want to gain the tools to assist people in fighting for equality, f fighting for their rights. And attorneys certainly uh, have that right, have that ability, and they have the tools to do it. And so I'm, I think I'm fortunate that uh, Prop 13 passed and I got laid off because otherwise I'd probably never be an attorney. I thought that, um, that your experience at um, the Freedom Summer had something to do with you being an attorney? Well, it, it did because I saw so many people being violated uh, by their, uh, on their civil rights. They were unable to, to do things just because they were singled out because of their race. And the same thing happened to me, you know, just having our, our house uh, invaded periodically by the, yeah. by the sheriff and so on. And, and I didn't really know what to do at the time. I mean, I was, I, I was 20 and, and I didn't, didn't have legal training, but uh, I knew enough to know that the police are not supposed to do that. And then, then finally I learned that there are a lot of tools available to the legal profession uh, that the police cer certainly should know about, but you can get redressed for your grievances uh, in, the, in the court of law. And you certainly couldn't do it 
locally, but you could do it in U.S. District Court in the federal courts, and they would uh, they would recognize your rights and try to compensate you for what had been taken from you, your civil rights. Another um, great thing I really liked about the book are all the photographs, because when you read it, it's, it's hard to believe that it's even true. You know, that was my experience. And the photographs are placed right in the um, text instead of how photographs used to all be just placed right in the middle. And that uh, brings a person there. As I found the back of the book brought you right to Freedom Summer. Did you actually save photographs from back then? Well, most of there are like 80 photographs in this book. Mm -hmm. And most of them came from the movie A Regular Bouquet. Mm -hmm. um, of course, Richard and I also, we, had, we have a couple of hours of outtakes, and the movie is 28 minutes long, so we have about two and a half, almost three hours of, of images. That s some of them, the lighting was poor and things like that we couldn't use. But I, I was able to capture individual frames that uh, illustrated what I, what I was talking about. For example, we, we, had no, we had no bathroom, we had no running water. So I built an outhouse. I have a picture of building that outhouse. Mm -hmm. I have a picture of making a shower out of a five-gallon lard can that I actually used an actual rusty nail to punch holes in the bottom of it so the water would run out. We would draw a bucket of water out of the well and dump it in there and take a shower. We didn't have any facilities at all until I, until I did that. And there's pictures in there of that. I don't know. Yeah. Those, are, those are just shows the basic living conditions were very, very different in Mississippi than most people were used to um, in their hometowns or at their colleges and universities. But we didn't have a flush toilet, we didn't have running water, and we didn't have a telephone. We were isolated. Yeah, it must have been like going back in time. And I'm sure it was, although all of our neighbors in the black community were just like us. So we really were living as the community lived. Living in their time. Living in their time, that's correct, yes. Yeah, yeah. What an experience. Well, I just can't thank you enough for writing this book, Remembering Mississippi Freedom Summer. I personally got a lot out of reading it, as um, I hope everyone else continues to read it. Well, Jeannie, thank you so much for having me on the show, and I really appreciate how you're assisting local authors and giving them a forum and uh, promoting uh, books such as mine, but there are many, many others, and I thank you very much for that. And thank you once again. I would like our audience to know that um, Remembering Mississippi Freedom Summer is available through Amazon also locally at Gaia's Garden in Santa Rosa, and that um, Charles Prickett is available for presentations. So look on the end of the credits. You will see his email and um, Facebook and website if you would like to have someone come for a fantastic educational experience so we do not forget this period of time. I would like to thank our sponsors, C Media Lab in Santa Rosa and the Sonoma County Gazette. Please join us next time for another episode of Writer Speak.